Become a better personal trainer by becoming a better man. Become a better man by applying knowledge from others who've walked across the fire and have a thing or two to say about it. Listen to Joe as he delves into some of the greatest minds of the best coaches in the world who bring inspiring stories and powerful insights to share about the human condition. Hear how the fitness industry goes only muscle deep and how a new breed of trainers are using emotional and mindset hacks to improve as men, evolve their game, and make the competition irrelevant. Trigger your pathway to greater fulfillment. With us, stand in the face of fitness. Welcome to the Fit Man Collective. Hi men and welcome to another episode of the Fit Man Collective podcast. I am Joe Hanny, your host and founder of the Fit Man Collective. This show is about helping people become better personal trainers by becoming better men, fit men. My goal is to help you redefine what fitness, family and freedom ideally could mean. I'm excited to get into today's show because I have yet another special guest, director of the Gym Hub, with 18 years fitness industry experience, including four years as a health and wellness lecturer and eight years as the owner of one of Sydney's most profitable fitness studios. On the show with me today is Steve Grant. Before I introduce Steve, let me tell you where you can find all the show notes, transcripts and links over at www.thefitmancollective.com. We're also having a group discussion about this podcast and so much more in our closed Facebook group, which you can request to join by going to www.facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash the Fit Man Collective. Okay, let's talk about Steve for a moment. I've already shared how he has 18 years experience. He's also an expert in building high performance teams and creating winning culture. He cuts through the normal personal development and business coaching BS and has new techniques to increase revenue without adding members. Steve's systems and unique recruitment and staff development techniques show gym owners how to, how to get their life back, adding no less than 10 hours per week back in free time to spend with family or doing what they love. He is constantly learning and traveling the world, studying the best fitness businesses and having great holidays with his family. He keeps fit, cycling, surfing and lifting weights. And today he talks to us about what it takes to stand out from the competition and gives you actions that you can implement right away today to become one of the best gyms in your town. Steve, welcome to the show. Glad you can join us. Thank you for being here. Get her, mate. How are you? Very well, thank you. Uh, so I want, to talk, I want to talk to you about the Gym Hub and your 18 years experience that you have in the fitness industry. I know a lot of fitness professionals and gym owners can testify for how much you've helped them. So for the purpose of the show and the audience, just please share in your own words why a gym owner would uh, potentially seek out someone like yourself or the Gym Hub to help them. Yeah, it's, um, I guess... There's, a, there's probably two main reasons. The, the first one is for, for business mentoring. So they, they own a gym themselves or a number of gyms and they're, they're looking to, to grow the gym. Um, secondly, uh, we also do things like workshops where we go in and help develop their staff in, in terms of like what, what they come to us for mentoring for. I think fresh marketing ideas is definitely one of them. I guess you, you probably find the same i imagine um most gym owners that i i chat to now have everyone sort of agrees that you know lead boxes and letterbox drops and things have sort of stopped working maybe five years ago <laughs> yeah so they're yeah they, they sort of contact me and and ask for you know fresh marketing ideas ways that they can differentiate their brand from all the other gyms in their local area things they can be doing to sort of get a larger online presence a lot of them, for example, are using Facebook already and, and generating like a high volume of leads through Facebook. But um, they've sort of, I guess, observed that it's expensive and it's um, a lot of the leads aren't always like great quality or a, or a higher conversion rate. So we look at things we can do to attract more of the right people and um, people that will, you know, eventually get, get into their gym and do some training. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so you work with a lot of these um, gym owners on, the, on, on refreshing their ideas around marketing. Um, is there anything that you can share that's been a highlight of your most recent work or something that you found to have worked pretty well or, or not so worked so well? 
Look, I think, um, like, we, we do work with a, a varied sort of gym model. So whether it's like a, an F45, like small group training model who is, you know, really pumping at 250 members or whether it's one of the, like the big box 24-hour gyms with 2,000 members that are looking to grow, um, most, most of the gym owners that I'm talking to just don't have a lot of time and, and, and probably struggle to put the amount of time they'd like to into things like social media and, and producing good blogs and, and content. So we've been, I, I guess we've had a, a number of results there for, for people setting up um, some automation around their email and it, like we might put a sales funnel together with a Facebook ad which goes in, um, you know, might have a free report download into a, a lead page or an email sequence, something along those lines, um, which, you know, if it works well once, um, you know, you might tweak it a little bit, but it's then, um, you know, an evergreen model that you can switch on and off as you need it. And it's, um, yeah, I, I find that to be, the, the, the gym owners we work with find those to be particularly rewarding because it's, it's not something they have to just keep doing every single day if they've been set up well the first time. Yeah, I think that's a great point because I think we can all fall into the trap of, um, especially I assume a lot of the gym owners that you have worked with uh, were personal trainers and obviously grew themselves to become gym owners. And that side of the business, the marketing side, is not something that we, we really think or value that we're going to need <laughs> as personal trainers because we're just technically gifted and we feel that the clients are just going to show up anyway based on the results that we get. Um, but to get to that next level, as you right, quite rightly said, it takes a bit of marketing savvy. So you essentially go in there and set up some simple systems for them that automate it, uh, makes their life a little bit easier because you can get bogged down and you can also be affected by that shiny object syndrome. You see, I don't know, <laughs> you might see a competitor advertising in several different places and you feel that you have to do that um, and it can become overwhelming, I, I imagine. Yeah, I, the, like I, I always talk to gym owners about, you know, what's working for them now and, and optimising those existing strategies. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I think in a lot of cases, they're probably doing a lot of things without um, a real good execution. Yeah. So I, I much prefer to, to find one really strong pipeline that's um, set up well the first time and, and then it is reliable and it is consistent sort of lead flow. And, yeah, there's, there's definitely that, that headspace you've got to shift from from being a, you know, a, a PT or perhaps a group trainer um, and then, you know, opening your own gym where you're, you're sort of responsible for filling another 10 trainers. It, you definitely got to um, learn some new marketing skills yeah. at that point. Yeah, and do you find that many trainers, are, uh, gym owners are, are quite um, accepting of that forthcoming or do you find they're quite, it's quite a challenge to begin with? Um, look, I, I think it's a real mix and, and I imagine similar to other industries, but there, there are definitely probably half the people I meet in the fitness industry that are shocked mm. that, you know, there is going to be a point where they'll plateau in terms of lead generation and um, they, they are shocked after that first three months when you've sort of tapped into you know, everyone you know in your phone and in your sort of social <laughs> work that, you know, th those techniques aren't necessarily as effective anymore and you have to, to bring on board some other strategies. So, um, yeah, whether it's sort of something they know from the outset or something they learn along the way, ultimately we, we all learn it, don't we? Of course. And I suppose it's, it's constant uh, testing, uh, assessing, reassessing and adjusting, isn't it? It's not that one system will fit all and it will continue to work forever. How long? Um, I suppose it's, uh, it comes down to tracking. And is that something that you um, recommend to the gym owners as well, to be very observant of their numbers and keep an, a close eye on, on their conversions at, at certain level, different levels? Yeah, definitely. I just think... Um I just think it's easy to sort of hear of people having success in a certain marketing funnel or a certain sales funnel without perhaps understanding what's happening at the back end and yeah. how yeah they may have done some A-B testing on the, on the titles several times or on the images used or the, um, you know, whether it goes into a lead page, whether it's just a, a pop-up form. It's um, a number of different things that are, that are important to test uh, just to, sometimes it's just variety as well because your your um, target market have been seeing you in a certain space, so it's good to sometimes add some variety there and 
and get their attention again. We, we find with, um, with a sales funnel, for example, a lot of people just focus on the number of leads that are coming in per, per week or per month. And, you know, by breaking down that, that sales funnel process into, you know, where did the, the leads come from, um, how many, you know, inquired uh, over the phone or via email actually came in for a face-to-face appointment, many of those face-to-face appointments actually chose a, a program and, and then lastly like what did they choose did they choose a you know gym access or do they uh, elect for a you know semi-private or, or some other sort of options as well it's um it's only only when you sort of uh, break down each step of the sales funnel I think you can find these great opportunities just to tweak something and um you know the the, the improvements in revenue are, are, are dramatic yeah I, I really as, as a gym owner, studio owner, I really got into all of those numbers. It took a while, I must be honest, I must admit, but when I really started to get closer on monitoring those numbers, it really did help. It really did help me understand where I could potentially, um, the nurturing sequence, if we'd like to call it, was falling down or it was actually strong. And then on the, the weaknesses, the, the numbers that wasn't quite, um, I was quite satisfied with, it was those that we'd work on for that week, that month, in terms of whether it was training, role playing, or just figuring out a new, another way of improving it. Um, so yeah, I like how you broke it down because I think we we tend to just to if if for whatever reason a lead came in and we didn't convert them to a, a consultation, uh, we tend to just to forget about that lead rather than actually let's focus on what why that person didn't come in. Was it a good lead, strong lead, or was it a weak lead to begin with? If it was a warm need to even reach out to us, then we need to figure out where that person's going or did the person at that step who took the, the phone call, the inquiry, did they follow through on a procedure, uh, a process correctly? Um, and from what I hear that you're saying, you, you, you set up processes, procedures for people to follow. Is that correct? So it's kind of, it is systemized. Um, so there is a, a system, an operation manual of some sort to follow. Is that what you help these gym owners develop as well? Yeah, so like outside of marketing, um, we we sort of set up a, a sales process for them, mm-hmm. um, which then, as as you mentioned before, it's important to sort of track and compare one month compared to the next. We we always sort of look for that low hanging fruit and the easiest way to add value and and generate some more income. So there's usually one step in the sales funnel that's um, got the most links in it. And I think, um, you know, to focus on that one step for a full month um, is, is really valuable and, you know, providing some, some training around whether it's like a phone script or uh, some role playing amongst your, your staff, uh, whether it's sort of giving them examples of what a, a good scenario looks like versus one that didn't sort of go so well. Yeah, it, it doesn't have to be as scary or as complicated, I think, as many of us have been led to believe in the past. <laughs> But it's, um, yeah, just, just having a clear understanding of what the actual process is that we're trying to do um, and what direction we're trying to take them in the sales process so that we can meet their needs. Uh, and, then, and then hopefully it's just a, a, an assumptive sort of close. Most people have, have come to us because they live local. Most people have come to us because they're, they're interested in getting healthier or overweight. And um, like you mentioned, it's, it's probably poor poor business uh, acumen if we're we're just assuming that the person that doesn't start day one um, perhaps um, wasn't the right fit it was perhaps um, more likely that they they haven't seen something they liked in that visit perhaps yeah, they didn't connect point. with the trainer or perhaps they're better suited to something down the track and and you know we've got that opportunity to to stay in contact with them yeah and it's a great point uh, thank you for reiterating that going back to uh, marketing and working with these different gym owners, what have you found the best strategies that differentiate them? Because I know that you can, we can all talk good marketing. We can, the perception can be blown out of proportion, should we say? But what really differentiates these gym owners amongst themselves? How could one gym owner differentiate themselves to another gym? Um, especially, I know in the city that I had my studio, I think there was, I think there was forty-seven other places for people to go and work out. That was. That wasn't even including the amount of personal trainers that worked within them places. So how does one differentiate themselves? What have you found useful um, in the gym and with the gyms that you've worked with? So my, my preferred method is, is education-based marketing. That's yeah. where 
we're, we're producing content and things of value to our target market and, and just giving it away for free. I think if we can if we can be seen to sort of produce a video blog or an article blog um, once a week or once a fortnight, we're, we're then actually providing a, a solution to a, a, a problem that someone has, whether it's to lose weight or to, you know, run without sore knees, as opposed to just trying to sell them something all the time. Yeah. So, you know, the, the thing we work on with the, the gyms in my network is how, how can we connect with them so that when they are ready to join a gym, that we're, you're just the, the, the number one choice? Um, how can we help them to understand that those sort of barriers or, or reasons they haven't been successful in the past is, isn't from a lack of effort or, a, you know, a, a lack of want, but it's perhaps the, the, the wrong theory or the wrong strategy of, of implementing it and, and give them a better understanding on how they should actually go about it when they do it next time. So, yeah, yeah like- we, we help the guys to post, you know, blogs regularly and, and then send traffic back to those. So it's not just focusing on those that 3% of the market that are ready today, but instead um, creating a, a connection. So they check our stuff regularly and they, they go past 20 gyms to get to ours. Yeah, so that's, there's a strategy behind it, isn't it? So you're, you're delivering content, you're delivering something of value. And I think I just, I think it was just this morning that I was listening to um, a podcast and they, they said, the minimum you should be given at least four pieces of value before you can expect anybody to reach out to you. Um, so I think it's good advice that you that you shared there, and then having a strategy for when then people do see your content, capture them in your influence, should we say, and then the back end, as we spoke previously, will nurture them into hopefully one day coming into the studio to ask for, for consultation or for help. Yeah, it's um, look, we we have a little six step blueprint for differentiating ourselves in the marketplace so I can sort of list them if you you think your listeners might be interested in them yeah let's um, go for it yeah yeah well um the first one is to identify what position in the marketplace that they actually wish to own and yep. by that it might be you know the the expert in weight loss or it might be you know a uh, an authority in olympic lifting or kettlebells or uh, identifying which position they want to, they wish to own. Mm-hmm. The second one is is claiming that spot as the perceived expert in the field. So by calling yourself the, you know, the where were you based here in Leicester? Um, by calling yourself the number one for weight loss in Leicester, a- again you're actually putting it out there so people can find you and you start to become known for that that one thing. Yeah. Number three is handpicking your marketing tactics uh, to ensure they, they actually support and help accomplish that position in the marketplace. So if you're running a, a PT studio in Leicester, it's not always going to be a good choice to get something like a, a shopper docket or, you know, something. Um, uh, you, you don't want to advertise in the wrong place if it doesn't actually align with that market position that you're actually going for. If, if you're a premium product, you want to advertise in a premium way. Number four, what do we get? Uh, Handpick number four. Uh, you, you need to create your own story that people will talk about. Mm-hmm. I think this is this is the space that a lot of people miss. Um, I always use the example of the the brands uh, on Australian television. Everyone's um, selling these craft beers and the craft beer space is just blown up over here. Um, <laughs> and the, the thing I love is these ads, they're, they're essentially selling the exact same thing, have come up with a, a real tale around how their beer was created and it's, you know, the freshest of ingredients and it's, you know, comes from the, and the water comes from the springs in the, in the valley and, it's, it's just an amazing sort of tale associated with how that brand was created. Mm-hmm. And I think we, we actually need to share our own story when we're, we're trying to differentiate because it's one of the few things that people can't actually copy. I, that's a, that's a, I think that's a great point. And we're, we associate with stories from a very early age, don't we? And yeah, I, I, like, um, I often share stories that I've heard elsewhere or I've seen you know, watching Netflix or something. And it, I, I just think our brains are sort of wired in a way where we can absorb stories well and we can share them well. And mm. I think it's up to us as the business owners to actually give them 
that tool, like give them the story about us so that they can actually pass the word on for us. Yeah, I think it was one of the most powerful things that I did. I, I suppose it came about when figuring out my why for UFIT Studio. Um, and in doing so, my actual personal story came out of that as well, which coincidentally attracted that type of client um, that was very similar to what my why was about helping women of similar age to my mother. And coincidentally, it attracted those type of females. Um, yeah. And they brought into it immediately because of that why, because of that story. It obviously meant something more than just a place to work out and get nutritional advice, should we say. Yeah, it was the same for me. I, I was working in uh, high schools teaching, teaching kids um, in physical education and nutrition and I just found it disheartening that they'd come to school and their lunchboxes are full of all the wrong food <laughs> and, you know, the kids look and feel the way you would expect when, the, when that's happening and I guess I realised that I, I wasn't going to have the impact that I wanted getting in front of the kids you know I needed to get in front of the people that were doing the shopping for groceries and the people that were preparing the food and that's yeah. where I sort of um, moved out of being a, a PT part-time and went and went full-time into running a gym and and really shared that story not not just with um, you know on a on a website but with each staff member that we hired and with each person that came in for a, a walk-in inquiry we, we went out of our way to sort of share that because it, it just gives them something to connect with and, and to relate to that, that no one else can really use. Yeah, no one can. Yeah, you said it quite right. No one can use that story because it's your own, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, the, the last two, so there's six points to that little blueprint. The last two is uh, number five is just share the story at every opportunity. So you, yeah, you, you have it on your business cards and your websites and you, you're saying it in person when you answer the phone. Uh, number six is to to raise the bar and and be that trusted sort of respected authority. Um, so you might get you know further accreditation in that specific area if it's Olympic lifting. You know, go and get a uh, accreditation in that area. Um, write some eBooks in that area. Um, jump on a podcast in that area or things that sort of help to cement you as as that 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 person. But yeah, that's the the six step blueprint we use and. Um, yeah, I hope that's something your guys can uh, get some value from as well. I'm sure they will. I'm sure they will. And um, that kind of leads on to another question of mine. I think you've shared it slightly, but why is it important to you to help these gym owners? I know that you have ran your own studio and it was successful at that, but what, why, was it, why did it become important to you to help these gym owners? Yeah, I, I think for myself, just you sort of do suffer a little bit. Like you, you love the industry and you but there's a time where you're doing these 60 to 80 hour weeks and you're, you know, you're in a customer service space. So you're, you're sort of absorbing everyone's challenges when you're yeah. personal training them or when you're chatting to them and they just walk through the gym, you still sort of absorb a lot of that. So I, I guess one thing I was sort of mindful, um, I, I got to about 18 months in running my own site and, you know, we, we were doing well. We had, probably 10 personal trainers working in there and maybe 300, 350 hours of personal training a week. Nice. But it was just exhausting. And, um, you know, I just wanted something that was going to be a career and something that wasn't going to kill me. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, a lot of the stuff that I share and um, now is, is helping people to understand that you just don't have to – it's not how hard you work, but it's some of the things that you learn along the way. And if, yeah, I, I'm really passionate now about helping other gym owners to understand how to leverage their time better and how to, you know, recruit and develop great people so that the, the business isn't just so dependent on you so that you can sort of nick off and have a great vacation each year and, and not fear that your business is going to fall over while you're away. Mm, uh, I like that. I really do like that. And I think the mistake that as, as we, we fall into as trainers is we, we constantly want to keep growing. We think, I don't know what it is or why it is. Um, maybe it's different for everybody. But it's like we're a trainer, then it's a case you can have the most clients, and then it's a case you can have a studio, and then it's a case of, okay, how many studios can we have? And it's just, it's just ever, ever growing. And um, I like how it doesn't always have to be that way. 
And that's essentially what you're saying. It might well be that you can achieve everything that you want within this one space or two or three that you have. You don't necessarily have to expand to 10 or even two. Um, you might be able to achieve everything that you want within this one space. Uh, but first, let's probably take a step back and question what values you have and what it is that you would like to achieve in life, uh, first and foremost. And then we can add the strategy in place that enables you to achieve that now with what you currently have. Is that what you're essentially saying? Yeah, it, it really is. I, I just think some people have huge goals and, and happiness for them will be based around having this sort of, um, you know, mini empire of gyms because of the scope of people that they can help or because of the, the financial reward. Um, for other people, um, like myself, it was, it was having enough income to have a great lifestyle for my wife and my kids. But it was also, um, yeah, like doing things that I loved, but the, the, the balance there so that, it, you know, I could be home at a, a reasonable hour to put the kids in the bath, to have time to train myself, to have other interests other than fitness. So it wasn't the, the be-all and end-all for me. And it's, yeah, it's, it's distracting, isn't it? There's just so many different places mm -hmm. you can get information from. And I think it is important to actually look at, well, what's, what's my goal? And who's, who's someone that's perhaps having some success in that area with not, not just the business aspect, but who's, who's successful in some of those other things that are important to me as well. Mm. And, uh, yeah, not, not climbing up the wrong ladder. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah. And I've done that many times as well. And uh, I just want, I picked up on something about sourcing information and going to the right places. And it, it reminded me of one of the videos that I checked out on yourself. I think you was talking about customer service. Um, and I'd like to ask this question because it was, to me, it was one of, when I was, First, getting it, first developing my studio, it was one of the things that was so obvious in my mind that I could start. It was one of the ways I could stand out because I think we both can admit that customer service in a gym environment is not the greatest. Let's let's say in comparison to, I believe it was the Ritz Carlton that you were speaking about. Yeah, um, and it was then I, can't, I, can't, I got introduced to that type of service through uh, an ex-girlfriend I think it was um, but because I was never used to that I was from a really really um, downtown city in, in a downtown place village in Leicester so I wasn't ex I wasn't used to <laughs> five-star service should we say um, mm. but when I it was something that I quickly recognized being in a commercial gym that okay customer service isn't the greatest um, the only thing that I could really focus on was the member the my client result because that's all I have responsibility for. And then that's why I kind of went into my own place as well because I could control all of that, the, the, the client result as well as the customer service. But I had to go outside the fitness industry to study, to model customer service on other businesses because I just couldn't find anywhere in the, the fitness industry that was doing it as well as I'd like it to be done. Is that kind of where you go? Do you go outside the industry to, to learn off those, to then bring it back to the industry because they seem to be doing it a whole lot better and successfully to clues right so it makes sense to model it to, to a certain degree yeah i, I do uh, i think because we're in the fitness industry it's quite easy as well to see a lot of those examples in and around us all the time and so yeah i've, I've like yourself i've made a conscious decision to get outside of that space and have a look at the real estate industry to have a look at um you know what some of my others things like restaurants Things like yeah, restaurants is a big one for me. Mm. Yeah, I, I, it's not to say that our industry is poor or not sort of trying. I, I just think some of these other industries have been around longer than us and they've worked on it and they've got some you know, super competent people that have been in there and it's, yeah, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. I, I was fortunate to have some, some personal training clients that owned businesses in real estate and were able to sort of help me to understand better techniques for recruitment mm -hmm. and and developing staff than what I had been modeled in the fitness industry yeah and you know better methods for retaining um, members and clients than than what I'd been modeled um, in, in the fitness industry and the, it's it's interesting how willing people are to share these things with us if if we ask. It's, yeah. it's just being, you, you probably do it yourself. I, I can't help but be in a restaurant now and, and observe what, what's happening and how <laughs> fast someone, you know, greets you by name and how clean it is in there and, and how willing they are to help. And 
you know, that, that whole process of the, the customer experience is, it's just such a massive opportunity for us at the moment. The, the fitness industry, I think through all the 24 hour, like the boom in 24 hour so, uh, sites, it's so much of the customer services sort of left the industry. Yeah. It, it, have to and there's still lots of 24 hour sites doing a fantastic job that I, I see mm-hmm. and I think that's um yeah it's still still plenty of growth for us as an industry overall if we want to be considered as as professional and um you know fitness professionals I really like how you angled that and how there's plenty of opportunities for it to improve it's not that we're not necessarily doing a real bad job it's just these industries have probably been around a lot longer and um I've had to uh, to, to a certain degree learn pretty fast how to keep customers happy, nurture them uh, because of the competition that they've had. With, if we talk of hospitality, there's, there's a ton of hotels in any one town, right? And that's, that's the same for us. If we're a gym owner, personal trainer, there's, there's plenty of them to go by. It's not to say, um, and there's plenty of people as well. We don't have to be in direct competition. Everybody's for everybody. So I like the fact that you, you do go outside the industry to, to gain experience and then bring it back to your mentor in your uh, one-day workshops to share. Uh, and you're right, I think these companies are really forthcoming in sharing their, their information, um, which only allows us to, to pay it forward as well. Yeah, it's, it's looking at those industries that w- were saturated before ours was. Mm. You know, the, the cafes in, in Sydney and Melbourne, are, they've been saturated for for years and you know, real estate's been saturated for years and we, we're sort of just catching up and a lot of us are still have that sort of look of shock on our face that really I, I thought it would be easier than this. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, the, it, the, the good businesses always stand out and the, the good, I, I go back to the same cafes all the time because of the way they make me feel and the quality of their service and if we're doing that in our gyms, we will also uh, be successful and, and, and achieve whatever we want to do. Yeah. Cafe Starbucks was one of the companies that I did study to a point when I nearly, um, <laughs> I was close to even trying to get hired there just so I could learn the system even better. That's how much I talked to it at one point. Um, but I was fortunate <laughs> enough to have a friend who was actually one of the, um, he was a barrister, he was one of the coffee masters for Starbucks. So he shared a ton of information with me. And obviously from reading their books, I think the first one was, uh, from ordinary to extraordinary, I think it was, uh, and then the the late one of onward, I think it was called by the actual owner himself. Anyway, yeah, so Starbucks, the experience, the, the, the looking outside the industry, I think it's a real useful tip for for gym owners. Um, it gives them a bit of um, breathing space as well. I don't know if that's the right word. Actually, they, it takes them out of their current situation and they get to see. Um, it's not always working in their business. They're kind of stepping out of it, aren't they? Getting a, a different outlook, a, a, a refreshed. Yeah, I, I think I always encourage everyone I chat to, whether they're you know clients in the fitness industry or just friends and and family. It's just to just to travel and just to experience, get into restaurants and hotels and just experience new things because that that's when I think we we get a lot of uh, creativity and a lot of great ideas that we can using our own lives and yeah, the, as long as the, the person running the business, if they've got high standards and they believe it's possible to deliver the service at a, at a better standard, that then it all just sort of flows down and Starbucks is a great example of that where they just had this vision of, you know, producing a, a coffee faster and, um, you know, <laughs> paper cups, you know, <laughs> laughable at the time. But, it, yeah, if... if the, none of those sort of ideas, I believe, are uh, uh, 100% original, but no. they've just been inspired by things that are happening around them. Mm-hmm. Okay, great point. So let's move on to the, to the next question I have for you. Um, in your experience, um, we've talked of some of the, the, the good stuff that gyms can do um, to help accelerate their growth, etc. But also from your experience, what have you seen that's not necessarily they're doing too well? What is it that they could actually improve on, apart from the marketing and differentiate themselves with how they systemize and automate things? Is there anything else that you can add to what you've already add, added, Steve? Look, another thing um, gym owners will come and see me for is the, the high-performance teams. I, I came from a, a, a competitive team sports background, and something I love is, is the way a team can actually synergize to produce a, a better outcome. 
Yeah, and great. you know whether it's sort of going in and doing workshops for them, or, or whether it's just creating a, an understanding of those things that perhaps don't align in their team, and they're sort of holding holding them back from achieving those extra levels. But we, like, I, I think of an example. We we went into a, a franchise gym in in Sydney. And they'd had a huge staff turnover before Christmas and needed to really rebuild a strong team. Um, they had goals of sort of opening a second gym and wanted fast growth. And they, they thought, okay, if we can get this model right, we can then sort of roll it out across the second site. Um, but when we sort of pulled apart their recruitment process, we found that they were actually attracting inexperienced staff that were, you know, did require a lot of hand-holding. Mm-hmm. And they, they were attracting people that weren't really after a career, but were, were just looking for um, you know, something they could do for the next six months. Okay. So, yeah, I, I think, if, I think if, if you want leverage and you want the ability to sort of grow, um, investing in, in actually bringing the right people through the doors to, to represent your business is, is hugely important. But also, like, the, the quality of the induction process as they come through the door and the, the ongoing training is just so important because that like good people, if they're very competent and they've got these skills, they like I would, if they don't sort of feel like they're being challenged and being um, stretched, they, they will look for that next opportunity. So it's sort of our role as the gym owners to, to, to continually invest into them and make sure they're learning new skills and make sure they're, they're having a, an opportunity to try new responsibilities as well. Hmm. That's a great point. I just want to take a step back there with talking about this. And when we are hiring, um, and it's very early on in the business, and let's say money's tight, um, what, and you're talking about setting up a, a process and, and setting up a checklist, operation manuals of some sort for these new staff to come on board, uh, that can be quite overwhelming to think of. Even just thinking of it now, I can imagine that somebody that's listening to this who's probably just got into their gym, who's looking to grow their staff, um, are probably thinking, okay, where do I start with this? Do you have any real simple tips of how somebody can start documenting their processes, their systems, uh, without actually having to hire out just yet? Yeah. Look, the the process, I guess what you're trying to do with recruitment is you're, you're trying to look at when have we been successful in the past? And you're trying to create a process or go back over the steps that you use that, that got you to that successful point. So it's, you know, look around your gym if you've got five staff there now. Who's the very best trainer there? And what sort of skill set do they have? What experience did they have before they came through the door? Um, who was the person that did their induction? And what were they taught in that first eight weeks? I Very think, cool. I think you know, going into their diary and going into your diary and putting in like a set time each week where you can actually spend time with them. Um, Even if you don't have it all sort of documented now and you don't have the ability to sort of hand that over to that that task on to another staff member to help, you know, develop a a new trainee, um, there's there's just so much knowledge and experience in your own head as, as the gym owner if you just spend time training them, getting to know what their goals are, um, you know, working with them each week, particularly in that first two to three months, uh, you can't help but transfer a whole heap of knowledge and a whole heap of um, value to that, that new person when they come through the door. Mm. Yeah, and that's a great point. I found that's probably one of the best ways to, have to, to bring a trainer up to speed is by just having them more or less side by side for you for those like you said, first one to three months. Um, and then at the same time, if you can document it, if you can create processes, procedures out of that, it's kind of killing two birds with one stone at the same time, as well as developing a trainer, right? Yeah, definitely. It's, there's all sorts of processes you can have when you are ready to, to create a system around it. But it essentially requires someone just to, that doesn't actually know the process just to follow you, follow you around for an hour and, and write down each step that you do. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's pretty easy. So in, in the early days at, in my business, my wife was actually in the police. And if, um, you know, I wanted to create a new system or a process so that I could delegate that role to someone else, I would bring her in and she'd follow me and she'd go, okay, so what do you do next? And what do you do next? And if, you know, without, 
a, a background in the fitness industry or without any sort of assumptive pre-learned um, knowledge, you know, before she got there, she was great at just being able to go, okay, and what's next and what's next and why do you do that and what's next? Um, it's, it's literally like an A4 page for a, a process, but if, if someone outside the industry can follow those steps, well, anyone in the industry will be able to do it. Yeah, and I'm just thinking of a resource now that I came across before. I learned this from somebody like yourself, and that was, um, I think, the book called, I can't remember the author, uh, Manifesto Checklist or Checklist Manifesto, I think it was. So for the audience that's listening, I'll put that link to that book in the show notes. That's one book, and I think something called Black Box Thinking. So it's a difference between the aviation world and the um, the uh, National Health Service. Um, it was shown the different procedures that those two organizations do and how they follow it and how one's a lot more accurate than the other one, believe it or not. And how the aviation world, it's a matter of life or death if they don't get a procedure right or they don't follow through on a particular checklist where in the, you'd think the same in the national um, health service, but it's not so um, forthcoming or accurate, should we say. It's a really interesting read, actually. Um, so there's two resources which I'll share in the show notes along with Steve's stuff as well. Steve, just um, because of time, I'm curious. I, I've got one more question for you, really. Okay. Um, and I really want, I know that you've shared the five to six tips already to the audience, but is there anything else that we could um, share that would allow the gym owners that are listening to today uh, be able to take away and, and probably implement or execute for them to grow today, to move forward, possibly get a client. I might be improve a system that, that, that we've um, shone some light on today or, or anything else. Yeah, I've got, I've got a few ideas. Um, this is one of the, the questions you, you shared with me prior to the, the recording. Um, I, I think a lot of the skills we want to develop aren't necessarily industry specific, but are more entrepreneurial skills. Yeah. I think most of us love fitness and I think most of us already can do a good group class or can train someone for a, a weight loss result or something like that. So my, my recommendation uh, for someone that's, you know, a personal trainer or perhaps running their own uh, studio, the first one is to, to com- create a compelling vision. Mm-hmm. So to actually sit down and, and start to think about what do you actually want your business and your service to actually look like and start to actually share that with your staff. Like yeah. At some point, it has, to, it has to start in your head and, and, and then you're trying to do things each week in a team meeting or in a um, you know, team goal where we're actually moving towards that. But I think the, the first important thing there is actually come up with something that's exciting where people actually want to join your company and join your team because it's, it's big and it's exciting. It's going to help lots of people and it's not just, well, you know, we own a gym um, yeah. and yeah. like that. And I actually yeah. seen a trainer um, on some social media handle just um, – he was launching that he was opening his own gym and he simply just titled his gym name. Uh, don't quote me on this, but it's somewhere along the lines of it was his name, uh, personal training, uh, nutrition, uh, kettlebells, um, yoga studio. It was like really Tom is really, <laughs> it's just a list of kind of services rather than just actual name. But I'm, I'm assuming with this compelling vision, you're asking the trainer, the gym owner to really just sit down kind of, um, no distraction, just come come up with something that they uh, will, but that they believe in. Um, and it might not be, the first draft might not be the most perfect. It's just a case of just knocking that first draft out, isn't it? And then just keep um, uh, chipping away at it and slowly but surely that vision will start to shine a whole lot more. Is that right? It's not an easy task. Definitely. Is it really? Yeah, and that's, I think that's the paralysis by analysis that happens when setting up systems as well. We're, we're, uh, we're under the assumption that the first thing we write down, we have to then stick to forever. And yeah. it's just not the case. You know, that's, that's just the first draft. And in 10 years' time, you'll have the 50th draft. But yeah. it's just a, a work, you know, as, as people and as, as business owners, we're obviously going to evolve and we're going to learn new things along the way. And I think um, your vision can can definitely evolve as as we do, but it's it's yeah, it's sitting down. I love that idea of you know quiet time. Remove yourself from the 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 mess of uh, you know clients knocking on the doors or something like that <laughs> for thirty minutes or an hour, and and just think about what what's it look like. Um, how many staff would you have? What's it sound like? What are the conversations on the gym floor? 
um, what do you what do you want to be known for? If you're sitting in a cafe in you know two years time and you overhear people talking about your service, what what do you actually picture them saying about your your business that will you know really make you proud and and excited to be sort of of, of what you've managed to create i i think that that compelling vision is is something a bit bigger than yourself so it might even involve the ability to sort of i don't know donate to a charity or to um to have a certain impact on you know diabetes or 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 weight loss or heart disease or something like that. But, yeah, think of something exciting and big which gets you out of bed every morning but is also good for, like, your clients will be attracted to that vision when they, they, when they hear your story and what you stand for. But your staff will, will literally go through 10 other ads they found online for a, a PT position because they want to come and work for you and, and that vision. Of course, yeah. And you attract uh, a much better person that way, right? Yeah, you'll you'll attract people that share the same core values. You'll attract people that won't that, that aren't just there for a you know I I did an hour and get, let's get paid an hour, but they actually care about achieving something significant. And they yeah, I I think that's that's the 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 first one and the and most important one that we sometimes skip over in in our uh, excited state to just get out and help people. <laughs> I think so, and I think we it's. A- quite a quick process and that you t- you you for whatever reason found the gym as a place where you um feel good it's, it's, pro- it's more than likely for yourself initially um you start to feel good about yourself you gain confidence it gives you courage and then it what turns out to be something that you uh, use as a hobby you then feel that you can help other people because you've managed to do it yourself. Before you know it, you've took the certification to become a personal trainer. You're working yep. in front of clients. Um, and then the next step is how there's just that competition amongst other trainers, gyms to, to grow, whatever that means, whether it's an income, whether it's a client base, however people measure that. And then before you know it, you're, you're probably setting up your own studio. And it, 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 re- it really took me few years to understand this whole uh, compelling vision and talking about the why and and what it, I'd like to set up because I found that I was just following the crowd for the majority of the time initially uh, which was okay to begin with but like you said if you really want to stand out as one of the best gyms maybe starting at figuring out what your vision actually is and how you're going to differentiate yourself um, probably is the best start I just wish that somebody would give me this advice that you're giving me right now a lot sooner because then I wouldn't be as probably as frustrated or uh, kicking, uh, kicking my heel, should I say, for for years or so? Uh, I could have done it a lot sooner. So it's a great advice. Figuring out that yeah, compelling vision. It's not. It's not my advice. You know, I was. I was the same. Someone shared it with me at one point. So yeah, hopefully it, it helps. It's. I. I just think we 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 know what motivates us, and we we have a bit of a vision ourselves. But the as a a business owner, ultimately our success is determined by how many other people follow us. Mm-hmm. And, and people do want to be led. We've just got to have that compelling vision. Yeah, it's a great point. And Steve, just for the audience, because you've shared a ton of value, where's the best place that I can send them? I know that you have a free report and I know that you have one-day live events that are going on. Uh, where's the best place that I could send people? So people can find me, uh, my website's gymhub.com.au, so gymhub.com.au. Um, we also do live uh, one-day training workshops for gym owners. Uh, we've got one in Brisbane on the 22nd of June. Uh, we've also got uh, one in Sydney again uh, on the 26th of October. So I can share those dates with you. Sure. Um, we're actually, tickets are 199 on the door, but for, for your listeners, if they're interested in, in coming along and they're, they're based uh, in Brisbane or Sydney or, or flying in for the day, um, I'm happy to, to honour like a $49 early bird price for them so they can come and network with some other gym owners. It, it is specifically for gym owners these days we're, we're all, or for like fitness professionals. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess the, the difference or the differentiation there is um, we're, we're not looking for staff but instead those people that are running their own PT business or their own, um, you know, fitness facility of some sort. Mm-hmm. I can imagine it being a great day out. Not only are you learning from some great minds, some people with vast amounts of experiences, but you're uh, interacting with other um, like-minded business owners, particularly in the gym. Look, I, 
it, look, it was a bit self-serving, to be honest, in, in creating it. <laughs> uh, it's called Titans of the Fitness Industry and the, the concept was just based around getting, you know, the best gym owners in Australia on a panel so we could just f- throw questions at them. Um, it's something I've always had value in, just, you know, having a coffee and trying to get in front of people. Uh, I just thought, you know, this this is something that other people would value as well. So we, we do sales and marketing and recruitment, like those top three things that I believe are the most important um, education on the day, but it's also just getting these other um, gym owners and, and getting them to sort of open up a bit. It's it's a bit different to the traditional sort of fitness events where everyone's very vague and doesn't <laughs> offer much. And instead, there's no recordings of it, so they can literally tell you um, exactly the questions they ask in an interview and they can tell you exactly what they charge and um, how they attract staff and all the, all the specifics that are quite quite relevant, I guess, if you're doing it yourself. Yeah, and I assume that's really powerful, especially when you have a real pressing question that for whatever reason you've not been able to ask anyone to get a specific answer from. So, yeah, I can imagine being really powerful. So that's at the www.gymhub.com.au, is that right? .au. Correct. Excellent. Correct. I'll share that link on the show notes. Steve, I have to say thank you for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for sharing your experience uh, with the guys um, on the, in the audience today. No, look, th- thanks for having me. I hope it's, it's been worthwhile. And, um, yeah, I look forward to, to listening to the rest of your uh, podcast this year. Perfect. Thanks, Steve. There you have it, men. Director of Gym Hub, Steve Grant, sharing how, as a gym owner, you can streamline your marketing and sales strategy, recruitment process, create balance, and aspire to that higher vision of yours. For our listeners only, Steve kindly offered an early bird price to join one of his upcoming one-day events, the Titans of the Fitness Industry. Go and check that out now at www.gymhub.com.au. In the meantime, go and check out the Fitman Collective private Facebook group, www.gymhub.com.au facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash the fitman collective and again all the details for this show can be found at www.thefitmancollective.com men i look forward to speaking to you next week but until then strive to become fitter men inside and outside of the gym thank you for listening to the fitman collective podcast This is your life. Don't settle for mediocre. Don't settle for average. Don't even settle for great. Beware the average man who attracts an average companion. Beware the great man who believes they've achieved everything and appears just a little too comfortable. Don't be them. Become the patient wolf. The Fit Man Collective is waiting for you. Know yourself. With us, reinvent yourself and your place in this world. Body, mind, health, relationships, career, money, all of it, and more. We can never be caught. We can never be categorized. The Fit Man Collective reinvents the future of the fit pro the fit man makes his own fate join us at the fitmancollective.com